Hello and welcome to Nursing Emergencies, Renal Stones. My name is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. When we're talking about renal stones, it's important to know where these come from because there's not a lot you can do once a patient has a stone. We want to help them to be able to pass the stone through and control their pain, but there's not a lot we can do at that moment to just magically make it go away. If we can help them to prevent recurrent stones, because oftentimes patients who've had stones in the past will have stones again. So 75 to 85 percent of these come from calcium. There's an increase in the amount of calcium in the urine as a result of loss from the bones, which could be caused by hyperparathyroidism or inflammatory bowel disease, bone metastasis, and oxalate. Oxalate binds calcium and causes this stone to form. So high oxalate diets also contribute to the formation of a calcium stone. It's not oxalate that's causing the problem, it's the calcium, but the oxalate is contributing by binding the calcium together. Another type of stone is called a struvite stone, which is a magnesium ammonium phosphate stone. This is the second most common type and accounts for about 10 to 20 percent of our stones. It is associated with urine, urinary tract infections. So if we see that the patient has a urinary tract infection, or we know that the patient has gout, we can probably look for one of these types. If the patient doesn't have either one of those conditions going on, it is most likely going to be a calcium-based stone. So the third type, which is relatively rare at 5 to 10 percent, is the result of uric acid. This is usually caused by dehydration and could also be the result of eating high oxalate foods. As you can see at the bottom of the screen, we have some different types of stones that are pictured there. Obviously, these are magnified and you're not going to know it when the stone passes as to what kind it probably is. On presentation, expect severe colicky pain. In fact, I've had people tell me that it's similar to the pain of childbirth. I've had neither, so I can't relate, but the pain is severe, and that's why it's here in capital letters. Of course, the more pain the patient has, the more they're going to clamp down, and the harder it is to be able to pass the stone. So we want to be able to treat the pain appropriately so that hopefully we can allow that stone to be able to move through the urinary tract and to get out. This is a picture over here on the right side. These are uh, millimeters. <laughs> so in case you're looking at it thinking, oh my gosh, look how huge that thing is. Uh, these are millimeters. Uh, urinary tract obstruction, so we can have urgency and frequency as a result. And in fact, leading to the patient developing renal failure. So this can be one of the causes of acute renal failure in your patient is having an obstruction from a stone. Hematuria might also occur, as you can see from that stone in the picture, it is rough around the edges. And being rough, it can ir irritate the urinary tract and cause some bleeding to occur. We can find our stones by looking at a variety of different diagnostic tests. One might be a KUB, which is a kidney, ureter, bladder x-ray, in other words, a abdominal flat plate, an IVP, or a CT scan. In an IVP, we inject dye into the patient, the dye is cleared out by the kidneys, and you can see the dye progress down through the urinary tract, so you can be able to see whether or not the urinary tract is obstructed. It's really very dramatic that you can see the dye coming down and just stopping midway if there's a stone stuck in one of the ureters. CT scan is the gold standard because it'll show us our stones both inside the kidney and through the urinary tract. Our prompt action then will be pain control. Okay. Again, we don't want that patient clamping down and potentially causing more problems with the stones and showing a variety of stones over here in the pictures. One is in the ureter, we see one in the bladder, we see some that are actually in the kidney itself, in the pelvis of the kidney. Stones that are less than four millimeters in size will usually pass on their own. 
Just give that patient some additional fluids, try to wash that through. Stones that are greater than four millimeters may need some additional therapy, such as extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, or a cystoscopy, ureteroscopy, or surgical removal. This is just an illustration of what the lithotripsy looks like, in that we have these ultrasound sound waves that are coming through the skin and through the tissue, going down to that stone and hopefully breaking it up into smaller pieces. In many cases, it works very well. In some cases, it may not, and then we'd have to move on to using another therapy. Well, thank you for joining me for Nursing Emergencies Renal Stones. Until next time, bye now.